Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's MAR guest lecture. We have two presenters that are, uh, I'm just so excited about uh, being able to listen to them and find out more about record keeping in uh, the environments in which they work. Our first is Matt Saywin from DEES, the curator of husbandry and records at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. And I hear he's here in Sarasota, Florida. So I'm still here uh, for a few more days myself. So we're actually in the same state. And then <laughs> Josh Corcho, who's the training manager for Species 360. That's the uh, records management program that uh, Matt also uses. So we're going to actually see uh, what's being used in the industry. And uh, I'm going to turn the mic right over to Josh first, who is going to begin the presentation. Thank you for having us, uh, Pat, and thanks for letting us uh, speak to your, to your course. Uh, of course, Matt, um, Matt and I have a chance to work together a few times a year now, which is very cool. It's nice to, nice to have another opportunity to work with them and, and to talk about some of the cool work that we get to do together. Um, so my name is Josh Corteau. I'm the training manager here with Species 360. Uh, we're entering our 45th year serving uh, the zoo and aquarium industry, which feels like a very long time, and it, and it, it, and it is. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've been around before computerized records. Uh, back uh, at the very start of things, we, we started as a, uh, just really a, a twinkle in someone's eye. A, a, a person's name was uh, Yuli Seal. Uh, he went on to also found another organization called um, the Conservation Planning Specialist Group, which is another, uh, another organization, nonprofit organization that works with um, uh, works in the preservation of uh, species in their in their natural habitat. So this uh, this this guy came up with a couple of really cool ideas a long long time ago, and Species 360 is um, you know is carried on in his uh, in his lead for about uh, as I mentioned 45 years. Um, so with uh, with that in mind, what we're really going to talk about is what is Species 360, what is the International Zoo. Uh, you know, community when it comes to data management. Um, so, you know, we can really think about it as operational um, software, to, you know, to serve kind of operational needs. We talk about it at a regional and a global level where we talk about cooperative animal management. And some of this uh, presumes a little bit uh, of, of industry knowledge. We'll do our best not to speak to uh, too many acronyms and too many um, too many zoo specific isms, but we'll, we'll, we'll likely trip on them and you can question and ask us what we're trying to actually say, because if we say things that are a little too um, industry specific, we might lose you. Um, yeah, I have so quite a few acronyms. Yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> we sort of die, live and die by acronyms. Um, so CPSG, we used to be called uh, ISIS, which I, you know, I'm troubled to even say it out loud now so you know you, you'll still hear people talk about their animals and their collections with their ISIS numbers because we were ISIS for 35 years uh, of course we changed for for good reasons um, so with that in mind some of the things that we do to serve the community again is uh, regionally and again internationally we serve uh, for this cooperative animal management idea and I'll get a little bit into that uh, which which you know, definitely revolves around species management and uh, something new for us in our 45th year is conservation research. Uh, we've, we've been cited in many publications over the years and um, we're, we have a lot of, uh, you know, scientific cred to our name given that we've produced a lot of um, aggregated data that um, serves the community. Uh, but just until very recently with um, the founding of our science team by Dr. Dahlia Kandi, who's based out of the Southern Denmark University, uh, she has a group of postdocs and um, master students, and um, she's um, spearheading kind of a new research partnership that we have with with universities who are actually doing uh, research on um, animals and, and human care, and and also how that it relates to to wild populations as well. So we're doing uh, native research now for the first time in in uh, in our in our life, and that's pretty cool. So that's opening up new new possibilities in conservation research. So who are we in particular? We are um, the, by any count, we're the largest um, association in this industry, except we're not an association. We are a nonprofit membership services organization. We're made up of, uh, actually it's now, since, since this slide was written, we're over 1,100 members in about 95 or 96 countries. I don't know if we're counting our newest member in mainland China as um, as a new country or not, because we had someone in Hong Kong before, but, but 
Um, we now have, um, you know, by, by any count, we have uh, the largest participatory membership. Uh, we are a, a voting body. Our, our members choose our board of directors. It comes from, um, you know, trustees from, from people throughout the community. We're this very strange software development uh, organization, because if you think of us as just a software company, um, you know, you're getting just part of the picture. If you think of us as an association, well, it's true, but um, again, it's really focused on what we do for the community, which is a services organization as opposed to like a, a membership uh, association or accrediting body, which you'd find with, um, you know, the American Zoo Association or the European Zoo Association or some of the other ones that serve the world. Uh, so we are this, we are this really strange, interesting uh, group um, with you know, members all over the world, and they're all doing something together. And what is that something? Well, it's, it's data management um, to the tune of, I think, I think we've got 21,000 individual Zims users is kind of what our current count is. So that's, that's humans putting hands on keyboards. Um, and again, over 1,100 different institutions doing the data. So it um, gives you an idea of where those members are with the map on the screen. And um, records management is key. So really what we talk about and what we provide software that captures is uh, information on zoos and aquariums. Um, we like to say we're guardians of, of captive wildlife populations uh, in zoos and aquaria. And in particular, you know, we're the, we're, we're the champions of protecting that data and making sure that it's standardized and useful. Um, so of course, this is becoming a bigger and bigger concern as we're entering the sixth uh, extinction as we call it there's you know there's more and more habitat loss more and more species that are being threatened in the wild and so what you're seeing in our industry is um, zoos and aquariums are starting to think in this in this concept of what's called a one plan approach whereas in the past you might have had uh, you might have had animals and the wild and animals in captivity and they wouldn't necessarily be um, thought of in the same breath or in the same um, programs. Uh, this, our industry is in the, in the middle of pivoting to making sure that anytime we're thinking about one captive population, we're also thinking about its, its wild counterpart and vice versa. Uh, so knitting those two things together. One of the ways you can do that is with data. Uh, so we, we have a kind of a new, um, a new space that we're moving into as well with, with what we call in situ research. So that's uh, research and um, records management for animals in the wild, as opposed to uh, ex situ, which is in, in, human, in human care at um, our member facilities. Um, so cooperation breeding programs is really one of those aspects where we serve data to a region. Um, and uh, that region is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's it, um, pardon me, just closing out a window. Uh, the region is, um, at the national level, it's at the uh, international level. Uh, there's a couple different acronyms that we could throw at you, but it really is just helpful to understand that uh, associations create these breeding programs and we support them with, uh, with recording and standardizing the way that they record that data and then how they output that for, for demographic analysis. So that all that data that goes into it is structured and collected by individual volunteers the individual volunteers are either at our members or at non-members, but they use our software to, to actually um, collect that information that is then aggregated at those regional associations. Uh, and of course, uh, research needed to improve animal care and welfare. That's a, that's a big aspect of what our software does is imagine human, uh, human record management uh, for, for medical records. We have the, the animal counterpart to that, as well as information about animals that are, um, you know, how they're, how they're being tended in captivity and, you know, how they're, how they're, um, uh, you know, when they're moving pl from place to place that their standards of care are maintained. So long-term uh, management and stability, this is really when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, making sure that the, the populations are uh, preserved in the wild. Um, you know, this is um, what we call kind of like the, the arc mentality or, or making sure that you have, uh, if you have a, a breeding program that's intended to either preserve that species, uh, that, you're, that you're dealing with as much of the data as possible to make sure that those, those populations are in fact, um, you know, viable. And that's all species specific, so it gets very, very scientific and very specific for each species right away. So I can't speak in too broadly general terms except for, um, you know, having the most amount of data is really going to improve your, your uh, ability to serve uh, as you know, you can imagine there, at least with us, there's 1100 different holders of, of information or of animals of data uh, and doing 
them 1,100 different ways would mean that you'd have very limited ability to uh, to speak about a, a distributed population. But with a software like Zims, you can you can actually get all that information in uh, in one quick view, which is great. And the zoos and aquariums and the associations have figured that out long in advance, so they've really thought about this back in 2000 is really where Zims started to to take root, uh, and some of the hopes and dreams uh, have come come to pass. So um, what we actually do serve our members with is uh, we like to say that, yeah, all that stuff that I just said is is the idealized, uh, the benefit to working with an online, uh, global, real-time, um, collaborative data set. Those are kind of hard sale, uh, sales to make when you're talking to an individual institution and our relationship, our business model is one where we serve individual institutions. Um, so our, you know, our clients are those institutions. Uh, and so we have to both offer them that big picture value, you know, why is recording data in a standardized way good? Why is it helpful for the, for the species as a whole that they, that they manage? Uh, but we also have to talk at, you know, real world stuff, such as st uh, staff efficiencies and productivity, uh, making sure that they can run reports that help them in, in managing their day-to-day -day workflow. So in, in some real practical ways, we're just a regular software company that develops software that helps them. Um, but we also have that kind of that, that one-two punch of being a, a really globally unique data set. Um, so we, we work our best to improve um, their, their planning, their ability to, to manage their collections, uh, to manage the medical care that they're giving their animals. Um, we, uh, of course, are paying attention to all of the trends of software as, uh, as software development changes. We are doing our very best to stay at the cutting edge, uh, making sure that we're providing our members with um, the best return on their investment another strange benefit to being as big as we are. Um, we're a nonprofit, um, so we're a pretty small organization given any other software at scale that, that we're talking about. Like if you think of any of the softwares that I heard you guys talking about at the start of the call, um, you know, any standard software that's used in an international sense, you'd imagine would be a pretty large organization, but all things considered, we're, we're pretty small, um, you know, but we, we do our best to make sure that our, me our members' dollars turn into results. So, um, you know, updating to the latest software trends and all that is a big part of what we have to do. Um, let's see here. Some of the stuff we can also do is, is help in compliance with government and accrediting uh, 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 application forms. There's a lot of uh, uh, that in our industry as there is with it. Many industries, there's unique uh, governmental relationships, but in, in um, moving animals, uh, you can imagine that, you know, especially moving them internationally, there's some specific uh, some regulations that apply. Um, so we, we support our, our clients in the UK with um, a pretty easy uh, output in the system kind of fills out a form for them. Uh, one of our other uh, main reports supports um, some USDA regulations here in the, in the States. Uh, so we do our best to make sure that the software makes their jobs easier. And uh, we do our best, and my job is, is on the training front, we do our best to provide comprehensive training to our members in whatever ways we can. We talk about three different main product chunks and Zims for Husbandry, this is where um, Matt spends most of his time, and this is really managing the, the, the actual anim, animal count, the inventory at the individual facility. Um, we talk about um, you know, being able to control and more, you know, pay attention to the demographics of your collection and you know, the relationships between the parents and children, that kind of thing. Um, we can make information available to your region. So if you wish to let uh, folks know that you have an animal available, or if you're looking for a certain animal for your collection, that's a kind of a listing service that's available in, in our system. Uh, I mentioned pedigrees, uh, so being able to figure out uh, breeding recommendations. Again, this is about um, having the, the best genetics that you can have with the small population you have. Uh, you can figure out what's called breeding recommendations from that. Um, and then identifying facilities um, with specific experience in the animal that you're dealing with to make sure that they uh, you know, if you don't know how to deal with a certain new species that you've never dealt with, you can find a colleague who has dealt with it based off of uh, our global holding. So we also deal with and have been dealing for 30 plus years with, with medical records for, for um, thousands of different exotic species. Um, you know, some runs the gamut of all the different types of records. You can imagine what 
uh, is recorded on humans, we do the same thing for animals. One of the cool things that we can do that you can't do in human medicine is that we can aggregate um, based off of all these different species. So we have uh, a series of these results that are provided for um, typical drugs given, uh, typical, typical anesthesias given, um, blood tests that are norms for that species, and um, mortality, morbidity analysis, which is what do they get sick of and what do they die of. Um, because we don't have HIPAA to worry about, individual records is not as big of a concern in animals. Um, we can aggregate data and, and give some really powerful metrics, um, and that's you know, worth the price of admission alone for, for most of our members is to, just to get access to that global reference inf information. Josh, what's HIPPOs? Um, what, what'd you say? What's HIPPOs? Uh, sorry, HIPAA, HIPAA compliance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry if there's a question typed up. Sorry about that. HIPAA is the, uh, the laws that, that are protecting people's individual um, uh, records. So you wouldn't ever see something like that in human medicine where basically you're just aggregating millions of of records together without any worry of getting sued. I can tell you about hippos too, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> so, hippos. Uh, so this is a, not a hippo, but you can imagine this could be a hippo's weight comparison graph. This is another tool that we have. Again, because we don't have to worry about privacy of, of certain types of data, we share things uh, liberally. And this is a case of uh, weight data. So anyone who's a holder of, let's say hippos, uh, you could compare your individual hippos to the global records. So in this case, what you're seeing on the screen is a box and whisker chart of all the weights that are known for this, this species. And this is a, um, I believe it's an Arabian oryx, but you can, yeah. imagine, you can imagine being a hippo. Uh, and each of those blocks and lines, it's hard to see on your screen, but they're age classes. So as you go on the X axis, those are the age of the animal. Uh, and then you can see the weights on the Y axis. And that blue line that charts across it is your individual animal. So you're saying from my collection, I don't know if this animal, as it gets older, is it, is it uh, over conditioned? Is it, is it heavy or is it light for what it should be? Well, you can, uh, using our data, you can plot your animal on what is a, effectively the, the typical weight uh, range for, for species in captivity. So that's again, one of those powerful, you know, worth the price of admission types of features we have. Um, you know, kind of to, and I'm gonna transition because I know it's um, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not skipping. A lot of the rest of the slides are, are um, just more uh, specific graphs like this, but it is worth spending some time on this one, uh, given that we don't get too stuck in the weeds. Uh, I mentioned Yuli Seal at the start of the call. Um, this is literally what uh, this, this individual wanted to see. When he started the idea of Species 360, he wanted to see physiological reference ranges uh, for exotic species. And what that means is basically he was doing some, he's a, he was a researcher. He was wanted to find typical uh, blood values. And, and what we're talking about blood values are like white blood cell count, um, lymphocytes, what you see on the screen right now is an example of, of some feedback for, again, a, an, an org species. Uh, he was looking for that information. And what he found at the time was is he could get the blood, he could get the, the results, but he couldn't tell you whether or not they were um, a standardized set. So he didn't have the ability to pool together all of these different blood um, samples from all around the different zoos. This is back in the um, 60s. He wasn't able to do that with any um, statistical relevance. He wasn't able to say it scientifically accurate. And so he literally created the organization Species 360 as a way to record basic records on animals so that we knew their age, we knew their pedigree, who they were related to, we knew their relative health status, we knew their weights, we knew all the basic information that we now record as, as a standard in the industry so that he could get this information. And now this information is available and it's to the tune of, uh, I think we said something on the order of 80 million medical records are pooled together now on 10 million plus animals that are in human care around the world. Uh, so this, uh, it's really the story of the tail that wagged the dog uh, when it comes to why we exist. It was really that person's foresight to say, we can't do this job well, we can't do it at the best level until we do basic records. And so that's sort of the takeaway, I think, from, from my side of the talk here is that, um, you know, you can, you can have good software, you can have great software, you can have people with good interests and you know every every intent to do it well um, but you kind of have to have a reason for doing it and um, that 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 reason can really um, bring people to the table and that's that's what I think is really why we are here um, as an organization and, and why we get to serve people like Matt um, so with that said I'll transfer over to Matt 
Shoot. My takeaway from that is you work for me, Josh. I do work for you, sir. <laughs> So we have a couple more slides and there was just more, more uh, facts and figures, but I'm happy to answer questions later. And I'm gonna go into some of the things that Josh has already talked about. We made a little more detail and show you kind of more of applied how we actually take care of things. But I'm starting off with kind of the history of my organization because why not to have your, your attention? So might as well give a little commercial for where I work. I work here at um, Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium in Sarasota, Florida. That's our entrance right there. And we were founded in 1955 by uh, this woman here. Um, her name is Dr. Eugenie Clark, and she's known as the, uh, as the shark lady. This is her um, working with some, some deep water sharks there, um, one that was actually recently named after her. And this is something um, I got from our website, and kind of a, a quote that we like um, to say, we're the guardians of the sea and all living things that depend on it. And that is, um, like I said, uh, a quote that Dr. Dr. Clark came up with. She unfortunately did die a few years ago at 92 years old, and she was still publishing research and still working with sharks. So pretty awesome woman, and she was um, our, our founding director. So um, what we are, we're an independent nonprofit marine research institution comprised of really world-class marine scientists. We have um, 32 PhDs working here right now, committed to the belief um, that the conservation, sustainable use of our oceans begins with research and education. So we're an aquarium here and we're founded in that science and education. Um, and um, really we have a lot of, and the, on the research side, I'm gonna get into the more than the aquarium later, which is where I mostly work, but I wanna give you that foundation. We do both laboratory work and field work. Um, this field work on the right there is, um, there was a viral vid video um, about that somewhat recently about um, Dr. David Vaughn, who um, started doing some microfragmenting and made it his mission to return a bunch of coral back to the ocean in, um, in big coral farms. So we have a big coral facility down in the Keys. We manage quite a few facilities around the state of Florida and using um, this digital record, record keeping system makes it much easier for us to do so. So these are some of our research um, um, interests here at Moat, some of our departments. I'll read through them in case it's difficult for you to see. We have um, chemical and physical ecology, sharks and rays, uh, conservation research program. We have um, a dolphin whale and sea turtle hospital. We do quite a bit of rehab. Ocean technology research, um, that right there is showing one of our AUVs, our um, autonomous um, underwater vehicle, which um, basically cruise up and down the coast looking for signs of red tide right now. Um, marine biomedical research, so we're looking at the uh, cancer and tumors and basic disease resistance in shark skates and rays. Um, stranding investigations, they see why the, the dead animals wash up on shore. Um, ecotoxicology, obviously looking at toxins in the environment. Marine and freshwater aquaculture, coral health and disease, ocean acidification, um, marine ecology, uh, fisheries enha enhancement, and then our Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, which is basically a study on the same population of dolphins for the past, um, I believe, 40 years. Oh, hey, Sarah's in the thank you, very cool. So, okay, go ahead next. Um, a few more, benthic ecology, um, environmental health. Um, benthic ecology, sorry, studying what lives on the bottom. Jim Coulter does a lot of deep diving, but also studying the clams and oysters and scallops that live on the bottom. Um, manatee research, because everybody loves manatees, of course. Um, we actually, in the aquarium, that ties in pretty closely. Our two resident manatees are the only two in the United States that are trained for research, so pretty cool with that. Fisheries, habitat ecology, and acoustics, basically studying how fish talk to each other. Um, coral reef monitoring and assessment, coral reef restoration, forensics, environmental laboratory for forensics, phytoplankton ecology, sea turtle conservation, and immunology. So quite a bit of research going on here. Um, that's the science we have here. We also have a big foundation in education. And um, the lower right is actually a studio where we do a lot of distance learning. And I, of course, I'm not set up in a distant learning. I have a, a webcam on my, on, my, on my desktop computer here. But if I wanted to, I could have asked for their help and been on a great studio and had you know green screens behind me make it look like I was underwater. But um, they do that for a lot of classroom in, like visits and things like that, that you know, they can visit with any classroom around the world through our, our, um, our education department there. And then obviously the other photos um, show some pictures of our educators with people of all ages. Of course, we have programs for school age kids, but we also, living in Sarasota, you know, we have a pretty large population of we'll call them older folks, the snowbirds, the uh, people 65 and older, the retirees. And we have programs, a lot of programs for them to do lifelong learning to, to learn about what we're doing also. So education being the second big part of our aquarium. And then next, 
um, the actual aquarium also. And this is um, either Hugh or Buffett doing some of his, uh, some of the, the husbandry research there. Um, it's a picture of our shark exhibit and then Amanda in the lower right holding some of our, our seahorses. But I'll get into how this all relates back to data in a second. I mean, now I mentioned science education and aquarium, and this is the facility we're building um, within the next four or five years. We're moving inland and like I said, a little commercial for what we're going to have hopefully within the next few years. That's our, our vision for our new aquarium that we're building right now. So go ahead. So my title is a curator of husbandry and records. And what that means, um, for one, I'm in charge of the daily care of our animal collection. And that's the health of the animals, the procurement of the animals, and the quarantine of the animals. I have some quarantine going on um, right here behind me, right back there, and there's a tank back there with two um, yearling American alligators right now. So no matter where I am, I feel like I'm surrounded by sick or otherwise, you know, new um, unquarantined animals that I'm responsible for taking care of working with our veterinary team. But I'm not gonna be talking too much about that today other than how it deals with records. The big part of my job that I'll be talking about today is um, the records. I'm our, I serve as our, our registrar, which I'm sure um, a few of you might be interested in that sort of a, a career potentially, um, a registrar type. Um, type work but of course they go hand in hand um, my registrar work is um deals a lot with the permitting and the sourcing of the animals i have icp on there not for the insane clown posse that's our institutional collection plan which is certainly important for our long-term care of our animals um how we source animals and where they go um once after we source them and then the daily records which i'll get into as well Okay, so husbandry data, which Josh mentioned, is where I spend a lot of my time, and it is true. Um, and data is very vital for any type of a research study. So data is, um, we're really data forward with all of our animal husbandry here. Um, any research project and methodologies can differ, um, but research is always based in having good data. And analyzing and interpreting that data, of course, is a good foundation to any research project. And using this program provided by Species 360 ZIMS, it allows us to have this great way of both capturing and pooling our own data and then sharing that data with other organizations um, around the country. Um, this picture I have down here is just some of our statistics of what we have in our collection. So once again, just some data on how we have animals grouped in, in our collection into our primary collection, rescue, rehab, strandings, et cetera. Let's go ahead to the next next picture, or next one there. So. Um, before I started working here about 10 years ago, and um, I'm not going to say I, I showed up and everything got better. <laughs> it wasn't anything like that. Um, but um, I want to show you in a second here how our historic record work, how our historic records were. Um, well, they were post-it notes. It was physical folders representing enclosures. We would have a record that an animal got here, and we'd have a permit during the period it was supposed to have gotten here. But finding matching an animal to which permit was collected under or which permit was held under was very difficult. And it was a real pain to obtain information. If the um, my VP told me, hey, we'd like to um, get, you know, I want a census on all of our animals, I would just, oh man, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's going to take me weeks. It was terrible. Just finding any information, historical information in particular, was very difficult. But of course, our current records, something like that, a request like that can be two clicks of my mouse. It's very easy to do. Um, and it serves as a digital backup for all of our paper records. We still keep our paper records in boxes or in file folders, but um, the Species 360 folks back it up on multiple continents, I think, Josh. You back it up all over the place. I think you're nodding your head. Yeah, it's backed up and it's secure. <laughs> I'm trying to find the mute button. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're we're back. We're we're cloud hosted. We're we're backed up. We're redundant. We're all the all the good things. So it's good and um easy. To, so it's much better than my file folder. <laughs> Basically, um we used to have our it backed up, meaning I would take all the files and Xerox them and put them in another building. <laughs> That's that was our backup before. Uh, much better now. Easy to access the access data because of the Species 360. So yeah, this is a look at some of our, our historic records. As I mentioned, it was um, pretty terrible. A lot of post-it notes. They really like putting the date and the month and not the year on things. Um, exhibits were named after whatever animal they were in. And unfortunately, like I, we have on the, so on the right, that blue thing says flounder tank. We don't have any flounders now in our collection. I have no idea what that meant as a flounder tank. Um, and just, you know, it says on the, on the one of those white things on the right, it says the permit for it is on the fridge. And <laughs> it's just really difficult to kind of follow that sort of information. And um, much easier now with uh, the digital records, like I said, provided by the Species 360. And this is just an overview of some of our, our with well, some of our files, just some screenshots from them. Um, I think after I'm done uh, going through this, I'll be able to actually take you into our, into our, um, 
database and show you a little bit more, but I have these on here just in case. There's a list of some of our enclosures on the left, like I said, much easier to access than file folders. And on the right is within one of those enclosures, a list of some of the animals that are in it. That's in our main shark exhibit. And then each one of those has its own um, record as well. So very handy for us to keep track of those. So really why keep records? We've got quite a few reasons on why we keep records here and why having this digital database is both important for us and useful for us. Um, reasons I have listed here, facility management, so legal obligations and permitting, the species management, so for an individual taxon, managing that species is much easier with the database, population management, enclosure management, then individual group or husbandry management, and then even, which Josh mentioned briefly, the individual's health management or the medical records. So all of those are important reasons for us to use this database. So first off, facility management and legal obligations. My name isn't on all the permits and my boss's is, and making sure that we're permitted properly for everything we do here keeps him out of jail. And I imagine if he went to jail, I probably wouldn't have a job anymore. So it's really important that we keep good records of all of our permits. You know, I, we apply for the permits and then have to know what we're permitted to do here. And we have quite a few people looking after us. The first one I mentioned there is the um, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. They um, put out the standards that we try to, to live up to and they're very strict and we try to surpass their standards and they require these digital records. So that's one reason right there to have digital records because our accrediting organization requires us to. Also, we're inspected by a lot of people all the time. Um, USDA, the AZA I mentioned, US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, um, FWC, which is our local state um, wildlife organization here in Florida, um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And then we're not, we're a, a private institution, so we don't have to worry about the Freedom of Information Act but a lot of zoos do have to also have their records easily accessible because anyone from the public can request information as well. They could request our permits since those would fall under a government entity, but a lot of other zoos, especially city-run zoos and aquariums, have to have access to that information for what they call what a FOIA, um, the Freedom of Information Act. But luckily working for a private organization like I do, I don't necessarily have to worry about that FOIA right now, but yeah, who knows in the future. Um, also very important for facility management to know where the animals came from. We have several animals in our collection that are considered prohibited species, meaning it's not legal to collect or possess them without permits. So if any of these inspectors were to come in and know where we got, we might ask and be able to ask where we procured that animal, where we got it from, and we need to have that you know, chain of custody to know if we collected it ourselves or what supplier we got it from to make sure it was collected both legally and then also so we could tell our own story and make sure we're getting good sustainable sources that it was collected from a sustainable vendor if it was something we purchased and the vendor that's trustworthy and knew where, where it was collected. So it's important for us to know our supply chains. And of course, the shorter the supply chain, the better. And us being coastal and mostly showcasing our local wildlife, we collect most of the stuff ourselves. So we know our supply chain is very short. And then that permit, because of Zims, is always associated with that animal. There's no question, you know, I don't have grouper written on a post-it note stuck in a file. I know exactly which grouper I have and where it was collected. So very, very easy to do, very, very helpful. So species management, um, this is a, like a little kind of broad spectrum if you're looking at just species in general. I'm since working in an aquarium, I mentioned some of the safe species, which is a, um, something started by AZA. Um, it's the Saving Animals from Extinction program. And they have um, a few animals that were involved with their program, sharks and rays and the Atlantic um, Acropora and corals in general, the Florida Reef Track corals. They're both uh, all species involved with the saving animals from extinction. And there's a number, I think there's 20 animals all involved in the saving animals from extinction program across all zoos and aquariums. These are just a few that we're involved with. And we're involved with quite a few stud books and SSPs, um, species survival plans. And these stud books are run through Zims also. And it allows them to track the genetics of any of these animals. So um, I think Josh mentioned that a little bit, really briefly. But it's really nice. Um, the stud book keeper can make breeding recommendations based on the, the, the family history, the family tree of these animals. And I put on the right there, a lion seahorse. We um, collect, you know, usually two, we'll collect a male and a female pair every year. And we'll spread those animals, you know, we'll breed them. We're really successful at breeding these lion seahorses. And we'll keep track of the genetics. And Stephen Young, who's over at the California Academy of Sciences, keeps track of all that in the database and knows the parentage of all of the lion seahorses in the country. And when we have babies, he can tell us, hey, you should send these to 
maybe an aquarium in California or maybe one in Ohio. And we'll send them there to be able to better represent the, the genes in the population and ensure that we have a sustainable population within our, our zoos and aquariums. It makes it much, um, where we don't have to do as much collecting from the wild. If we can take two animals' genes and spread them amongst all zoos and aquariums, it's much better um, for all facilities. So go ahead to the next slide. And then population management within our institution is certainly important as well. Now this is like for animals that might not be tracked through a species survival plan, but we're still doing culture on them. Um, I used our neon gobies here as an example because I have lots of pictures of them um, breeding and their babies are pretty cute sitting on top of that PVC pipe in that bottom picture there. Um, those are the eggs developing. You can see their eyes on the bottom and they're pretty adorable. Um, anyways, we like to uh, keep track of them in, in Zims because um, it allows us to maintain their genetic diversity. Um, and that's with any of our species. We're breeding bonnethead sharks, cichlids, uh, cuttlefish, and through Zims we can keep track of their family tree of any of the thing that's breeding. And um, with these and actually with our seahorses, our um, culturing biologist, that's mostly Amanda Hodo right now, just to give her a shout out. What she does is um, we'll collect a pair or we'll have a pair and um, know that they're you know genetically unique and we'll give them a last name. So we might call the Neon Gobi in that upper right corner. They might be the Jackson family and um, any babies that they have will be the Jacksons. And we'll know, don't breed Jacksons with Jacksons because they're gonna end up with some funky Jacksons. <laughs> so we'll have another family then that are um, the Johnsons, probably should have picked them, um, or the Cruteaus. And we'll, um, you know, know that that is their lineage. And just to give people the idea that might not understand population genetics, but everybody probably knows that the Jackson shouldn't mate with another Jackson. It allows it much easier for us to know where to spread animals within our institution to not, uh, if you want to create pairs again later. So it's really helpful to do all that in Zims and track that parentage. Uh, enclosure management, um, this is where I do uh, most of my work, a ton of my work. Um, we keep track of environment, environmental measurements and the picture in the upper right hand corner are some pictures of water chemistry um, testing that we're doing, testing for ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, salinity, temperature, all of that. Um, you know, we've been doing that for years. Before we had digital record keeping, we our first foray into digital record keeping was keeping track of our, our environmental measurements in Microsoft Excel. Really easy to do, um, but it was separate from the animal collection. Now those animal records are constantly tied into our environmental records and it's really helpful to have them tied in together. So really nice, you can, you can graph them really nice in the database as well, but it's nice to kind of always have that association where if there ever is a problem, we can go back and look. Kind of a cool thing with those neon gobies, when I had them in quarantine, the water was a little cold, 72 degrees. We moved them into their current breeding lab, and as soon as the temperature is 78, everyone had babies. <laughs> it's pretty neat. So we can see that definite change and tie those in exactly um, to the water chemistry, um, those breeding events. Um, of course, we can know which animals are in which, which in which enclosure, which is really important, again, for breeding, but also knowing which species can live together peacefully or not. Um, in an aquarium, a lot of the times you're essentially keeping um, – you know, the lions and with the antelopes and with the African wild dogs and with the jackals at a zoo, you have the ability to spread everything out. But in, the, in an aquarium, we're keeping the predators with their prey a lot of the times. And we need to know when that's okay and when that's not okay. And by um, keeping track of that in this database, we'll know, you know, these animals do coexist peacefully. We can take great notes and, and know how we allow them, you know, provided for them to um, exist peacefully, or if it doesn't work and they don't do work together peacefully. And then we can also keep track of moves between enclosures. So if I have tank A and tank B, and I moved an animal from tank A to tank B, and then three months later I have a parasite outbreak in tank A, I'll know, well, I should look out for tank B too, because that animal was just in that other one, and maybe some hitchhikers went with it. So it allows us to better track those transmission of disease. Now, individual animal or also group husbandry, um, Zims does a good job of keeping track of both individuals or groups. We use groups a lot in aquariums because, um, take for example, these three, um, three cuttlefish here, it might be difficult for me to tell them apart. I can't tag them, I can't put a transmitter inside of them, so I will probably most likely manage those as a group. Um, so either an individual or that group is gonna have its own unique, um, what, uh, species 60 calls their global accession number or their GAN and that's unique worldwide it's like a social security number that's always associated with that animal and that gives us that global connectivity kind of cool we sent some um, some jellyfish to um, or it's Florida aquariums we sent Florida aquarium jellyfish a long time ago 
And then they gave some back to us and they ended up giving us back the same jellyfish we gave them. And we knew it through the global accession number that these were the ones that we had sent them a while ago. May have been the other way around with that, but either way, the story is the same, that we can keep track of those individuals and know, oh, these are the ones that we initially got from Tennessee Aquarium. We can track their whole parentage that way. It's really neat. Um, we can also, of course, through the husbandry, track food consumption, any training or enrichment, and of course, the welfare of the animals as well. There's a really nice welfare module that we can go right on our um, our phone even, take it out and ex uh, talk about the welfare and document the welfare, any any questions on welfare, if any of our animals, we monitor that really well um, through the application. So it's very, very broad. And now our health records, um, I mentioned quarantine because that's what I do, I had to put that first, I had to put some pictures of some fish parasites on there because it's what I like most. Um, we can keep track of any of these medical treatments and procedures, any medical notes or physicals, our veterinarian, she can go out and put any, um, any notes she wants on any animal and have it associated with the animal forever. It's, it's amazing. Um, you know, we don't have to, you know, if, you know, if we have an issue with an animal, you know if that was the same one, we're not really sure. Do I have to go look in the file and see what's going on? No, it's always going to be right there and accessible. So it's, it's really easy to use. <laughs> Josh is holding up a, uh, <laughs> what, it, what, what it was um, something I made. It's a, a, a laptop sleeve is what you're using it for. I use it as a hat. But Josh uses it for a laptop sleeve. It's um this picture on the right, very similar, our uh, uranema. <laughs> so that's what he's holding up there. Um, we can keep track of medications, um, the growth uh, of animals, and even parasites they have through their their medical um medical records. No better way to keep your laptop safe than to wrap it in some sort of uh, disease. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. So the individual health management and the medical records, um, just to show this about, Josh already kind of mentioned this about sharing information globally. He showed that um, they had the, um, the, the blood values and, and keeping track of that and sharing that worldwide. What really helps with, with fish also are um, some of the medical, see where I have it here, medical resources, the, um, the summaries, the drug, use, the drug summaries, it's, a, it's the drug use extracts, I think. I highlighted the wrong one on the bottom there. But um, it's great if, if we have a question, we have an animal, and our veterinarian wants to know what drugs have worked well on in the past and what hasn't. So you can do a search on that animal, and Species 360 is all this information together to know what types of antibiotics have been used on, let's say, a bonnet head shark, um, what types of anti-parasite drugs have been used on a a queen angelfish and how successful they were. So all that you know, work we're putting in here is useful for us, but it's also useful worldwide to any other aquarium that's using this stuff. So I should thank Josh for that because I probably never have, and it's very, very helpful for us. Um, and data in here is also super important. There's different ways of us doing it, either um, through a centralized data entry or a distributed data entry. I'm either um, entering the data myself and my team, um, and with that, I could have errors transcribing, errors with penmanship. You know, some of the aquarists I work with have terrible penmanship, and it puts some of us having a lot of computer time. But with that distributed data entry with the biologist entering data, you end up with some inconsistent verbiage, um, a lot of smiley faces, you know, some incorrect data every once in a while. And it requires a lot of training to train a lot of these people. I tend to use the distributed data entry a lot more um, just to try to get them tied more to the data and more invested in it. Um, but ultimately, I, as a registrar, I'm responsible for that data. Um, that picture I have in the lower right was the, basically the amount of data points put in by um, about probably 10 or so of our aquarium biologists. Go ahead to the next slide there. And data out is where we get buy-in from the biologists. This is where they're motivated. So um, they can put in data all day, but if they're not getting anything out of it, they're not gonna care. <laughs> they just think they're just putting it into oblivion. So the reports that Josh mentioned are huge. Um, we can look at trends in food consumption. We can look at the genetic diversity, as I've mentioned many times. So we can find the sourcing of the animals. So let's say if um, we need to find some Blemings tangs or unicorn tangs and I don't have to look through a bunch of records here. I can search, well, where did we get our Lemmings things in the past and call up that supplier right there. I don't have to start over. If somebody 20 years from now wants to do that and I'm not working here anymore, maybe, they can know where it is here um, in our data. Um, if someone want, does an inspection or we have to do a report, rather than me spending weeks on a, that report, the reports now, don't tell my boss who's in here. I can do most of it in just a few minutes. It's really nice, <laughs> the reporting. So it's, it's really helpful. Um, the water chemistry trends down here, um, the picture I have shows um, a salinity trend for our um, 
one of our exhibits. We call it our E1. Um, I give it a, a description, Florida Reef, but it used to be a, a freshwater exhibit with some, some sturgeon. And you can see right in the records there, right around um, end of May 2016, probably actually is more June, I guess, it went from freshwater to saltwater. And then you can see our saltwater values kind of bouncing around. I'm pointing at the screen like you guys can see. <laughs> Anyways, um, doing a census is easy. Looking at sensitivity to medications is really easy to find that can exhibit compatibility and whether animals are compatible with each other. And then PR marketing and education find a lot of use in this as well. I've shown them how they can run a census and find out what animals we have in our collection. And it works really nice for our education team if they wanna know what animals are in what exhibit, they can just look at the census of that exhibit and see exactly what's in there if they want to write up a uh, a program. Or if they're doing a program on Atlantic blue tangs, they can run a query on where are the Atlantic blue tangs, then know where they're at. They usually, usually call me anyway, but, you know, this would work in practice. <laughs> I don't know where they can find those animals. It might be, yeah, that's all I got for the, for those. Um, I have a big manatee. Um, this is Hugh who likes to crunch his nose against the glass to make all the kids excited. But if you guys have any questions, um, and I can also go and um, bring up my my Zims if you guys wanted to see that. But um, if you have questions for Josh or I, maybe we should take those first in case there's any burning questions. Do we have any questions? I could take a quick look at the chat and you could also grab your mic. Uh, Emily Mercer uh, said, if someone wanted to work in this field, would a background in records management be enough or would we need to have animal biology knowledge as well? Any other subjects or experiences you recommend we study or pursue to move into this field? You want me to mention it or you want to talk, Josh? Well, I think we could take it from two different directions. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a bit of a background uh, in biology. Um, so my, my, my road in was sort of um, one of uh, luck and, and also, you know, I had the right um, c combination of, of technical skills and software as well as um, some, some, you know, light animal management uh, experience. The vast majority of folks in the registrar role, which is folks who'd be using our software or veter veterinarian technicians, um, you know, now more and more as Matt noted, you know, we're doing, uh, you know, direct entries of folks uh, who are actually also the animal care specialists are al also doing direct entry of, of records. It's kind of depends on which audience you're talking about. Is it the veterinarian? Is it the records management? person um, those those all have different track records uh, you know sorry tracks into the into the field uh, so when we're talking about um, our core user base the records management people it absolutely helps to have um, some foundations in data management um, you know it's becoming more and more of a professional job over the last 30 plus years uh, meaning that you know the actual um, the actual knowledge of information management is is a you know more and more of a understood and respected field, uh, but it, it definitely is not um, the same as being a, a library, um, you know, records manager or a, a corporate uh, records manager. You know, having that touchstone with biology and, and you know, maybe more than that is having, having a, 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 you know, zeal to want to learn it uh, because there is so much to learn as there is in any industry, but um, the zoo and aquarium field is one where, um, you know, maybe Matt, you can you can add a little bit of like on the ground uh, experience, but it's one where um, I, I liken it almost to mission. You know, being a being a, a missionary uh, who's willing to go anywhere where the you know where 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 God calls you, <laughs> and being. <laughs> And, and working for relatively uh, small amounts of money. It's not a, it's not, it's not a terribly lucrative industry. Uh, you have to be called to do it. And that's something that I don't think is necessarily as shared with other records management fields. But Matt, I don't know if you have anything to add. I know a lot of the registrars that, that I've met, maybe not the ones that are, well, it seems like we've all started as some type of a keeper or something like that as a, um, I started as an aquarist, mostly doing the, the, um, the quarantine type stuff and then kind of stepped into the registrar role because I just had a big interest in it. And that's what it seems a lot of them have started on that side, but that's not to say that you need to start on that side and to be a registrar, you don't have to have that zoology background. Um, I think having the data management background, if you know you wanna be a, a zoo or aquarium registrar, is even more important to have that background um, that you're getting, through, I believe, through the coursework you're doing now in, in records management. and you know, you just take that strong background in records management and apply it to being, you know, the, the zoo world, um, as opposed to 
me taking my zoom owls and then learning how to how to manage data <laughs> it seems a, bit, a little bit more challenging it was very the what you're learning there is much more technical skill and i think you can apply it to the zoo field like you would any other field so if you knew that's what you wanted to do um work in a zoo or aquarium having that records background is is really solid um i would think and if you and if you don't have the specific industry experience, um, you know, depending on where you're located, uh, your local zoo, aquarium, um, you know, sanctuary, uh, rehab clinic, wh whoever it might be, if you have a love to want to work with and serve, uh, you know, species conservation, most places take volunteers very readily at some level, uh, be it a docent, be it a, you know, volunteer educator. Um, that was my first job was as a, a wolf research, uh, sorry, wolf um, sanctuary, um, you know, doing, doing anything that, you know, that, that helps an organization out will get you a foot in the door. And then you figure out if you really like it too, uh, which is a, a benefit. And then, you know, if you come in with records experience, as Matt mentioned, you sort of become the de facto expert at your organization too, because there's not a lot of um, duplication of efforts in that space. So if you're the records person, if you're the registrar, if you're the like, the curator of data at your place, you're probably the, uh, the go-to for everything. So that it's kind of empowering. Uh, also means that it, it's your job and there's not a lot of people to help you all the time, but that, that <laughs> Sometimes it's a good thing for people who like to control things. And I think data records, people like to control things. So that works. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the ability, you know, I'm doing records, but I also, you know, share an office with two baby alligators right now. Um, there was an indigo snake in there a couple of weeks ago and I've had crocodile in here. I've had siren, you know, you get a lot of animals in my office like that, which is pretty cool. If you're just into animals, have a passing interest or passion for animals and still want to do data management, working at a zoo is a good way to do it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emily. So I think you uh, said you may have a little time to show us the uh, actual uh, records management software there. Yeah, yeah, I can, if you don't mind, Josh. That's great when a member sh shares their data because uh, we don't technically have rights to share their data. So if anybody's <laughs> wanting to do Josh, it. Josh, you're gonna see if I'm doing this right. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, his organization has is, is approved it, so. <laughs> I'm gonna go quick, <laughs> no screenshots. No. <laughs> So um, just to show quick what I've mentioned about the enclosure here, I won't go into my institution and all that, but just to show how the, the utility of this and kind of go through the different steps that I mentioned, I can go and show a, a tree view here. And this is all of our, our enclosure groups. Um, I'll expand this, go through all of our enclosures here. I can pick an animal out. Um, for example, I'll pick out our Florida reef here, open this up and it's got all of our details. Oops, I meant to expand this all of our water chemistry measurements that I mentioned here. So I can go and graph those if I wanted to. That's all under these pictures, so I don't know how to do that. But anyways, I can go into the occupants of this then. Um, mostly corals in this exhibit. Um, what's the one I mentioned before? I went with a, um, a it was the, the, I don't remember who I was using, when the sun, it was a clown, a clown ras, I think is the one I had mentioned earlier when I was kind of going through this. Here's a clown ras. Click on this. We have 1.1 clown rats. We have a male and female. They're moved into the enclosure July 19th, 2016. And click on this. And this will once again. So now I'm out of the enclosure module. I'm in the animal, individual animals module. I can open this up. Oh, open this up with, uh, I don't expand all very often because it gets a little overwhelming. And any information here on it. I don't have any weights on this animal because we put it in there and we haven't ever caught it out. Any notes that we have all in here, which is really nice. You know, we have, there's a, a hurricane on this data, I have that and there is a note. Then any transactions. So we got this from KP Aquatics on May 31st, 2016. And then, you know, we had, we weren't sure if it was a male or a female. We had 0 .00, you know, 0 .0 0.0.0.2. And then February 26th, we decided it was a male and a female because we saw some breeding behavior with them. So, and there's a lot I can go in beyond that. There's medical information and, you know, Josh reminded me maybe what would want me sharing all that. <laughs> Anyways, this is kind of just neat to see all this information that we have on every animal in our institution. We have that. So it's, it's pretty great. Thanks, man. Right. Any questions about all that? No. If you do, you could uh, place a question in the chat area or uh, just grab the mic. No, I don't hear any. Well, you know, not hearing any, I'm going to uh, thank you, Matt and Josh, for presenting today. This was fascinating to me.
Uh, I yeah, I, I really am uh, quite uh, amazed at all that goes into your work and the volume of data that you're responsible for. Yeah, we really enjoy it. Yeah, it is. It's it's a unique opportunity for sure. And that software looks so helpful, and the fact that you can use that across the world to, as you said, aggregate that information is just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a small a small plug for that. Um, we do have a teaching partnership um, level, service level. I mentioned research partnerships. So we have a lot of universities that are joining just to have access to that global data. Uh, we also have a, a teaching license program. We're working with 26 uh, different schools and universities and colleges around the world. And they're actually teaching records management within their curriculum now, which is, um, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my pet project. Um, as a, a global effort, it's really, a, it's a challenge. I wouldn't say it's difficult, but it's a challenge to to uh, instruct everyone who needs to know at the highest level how to use a, a software platform like this. And I get um, the, the joy to work with Matt once a year teaching uh, regionally <laughs> at, the, at the AZA school. We actually spend six days together, um, 12 hour days, you know, teaching registrars, basically uh, all the things that a registrar needs to know, including um, using Zims. Um, but, you know, having, having the ability to have universities and schools uh, assist in teaching us, we have um, partners all across Europe and Australia and uh, North America. And it's, it's great to, to have schools actually considering it, you know, relative information before you actually enter the, the job field to, to have these skills. So that's, that's been a benefit for us as well. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll have to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. And then how I met Katie, we have a Zoological Registrar Association also. Um, if anybody is interested in it, you can go on, um, I don't know, just search ZRA Registrar. <laughs> I don't know the exact website. Uh, the website is zooregistrars.org. There you go, zooregistrars.org. Thanks, Katie. Hey, hey, Katie. Hey. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for the, uh, the notice about the, the, the talk. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs>